Cliff Mass, welcome. Thank you very much. Charles Mudede, welcome. Thank you. I have called you both here today because we need to settle a beef, or at <laughs> least explain the beef. The two of you have a major, major disagreement. People in Seattle have been following it closely. You two have been deeply involved in it. It involves a huge issue, climate change. So we need to get into this and get to the bottom of what's going on. First, though, before we get into your argument, I want to talk about something that I've found interesting in researching this, your commonalities. You've been at each other's throats over climate change or one particular subset of the climate change debate. But in fact, both of you believe in climate change. Is that correct? I do. I do. And That's Cliff? Right. Yeah, I don't like using the word believe, but I, I, I certainly know that climate change is a very serious issue. Okay. Neither of you voted for Donald Trump, correct? Yes. Yes. So we don't have like any fire-breathing Republicans in the room, and both of you believe in the importance of fact-based discourse. Did you vote on Gary Johnson? Absolutely. Facts, <laughs> facts are good. Facts, Charles? Uh, facts are, are, are useful. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll, we'll take that as a starting point. Did you vote for Gary Johnson, Charles wants to know? Who's Gary Johnson? Okay. Right. <laughs> All right. I think I we answered have, it. We so, have your answer there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gil Stein? <laughs> okay. So, Cliff, Charles has called you a very dangerous weather person. He's gone so far as to call you a man with a broken mind. He is upset with the way that you are describing climate change and its effects. And you're upset with his language. So let's start there. When we talked ahead of this, you, you said you have a real problem with the way that Charles has addressed this issue and you in particular. That's right. That's why I'm here. I, I really believe that name calling and putting people down ad hominem remarks is inappropriate for this kind of discourse. Uh, we can have a difference of opinion about how we deal with climate change. That's fair. We can talk through the facts. But I think calling people names, you know, ad hominem stuff like you know, you're losing your mind or you're dangerous, things like that, I think that's inappropriate for this kind of discourse. And I think it's inappropriate for the stranger. Okay. Charles, mm -hmm. why are you calling Cliff a dangerous weatherman or a dangerous weather person? And uh, do you hear his criticism? I, I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't say saying um, someone's dangerous is is calling a person, you know, calling names. That's the first thing. I'm just saying that the conclusions or some of the um, the uh, the ideas that he's that he's uh, publishing or or posting are dangerous. So what's so dangerous? Um, I think that climate change um, is 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 real, and I think that there's a real resistance to addressing it, and we're running out of time. And so when we have um, comments that, that I think make um, that sort of not so much, that are not wrong, I have to make this point, they're not entirely wrong, but um, they give people reason to doubt whether or not uh, the situation is grave. And to me, that is a, that's what I would call uh, a dangerous. So let's get out of the abstract before you respond to that and, and bring a concrete in. There are many examples that you two have clashed over on this particular issue. But let's take a very current example. The Seattle Times just this week had a story about a tree in the Arboretum that has died. Charles, you have a long-running obsession with trees. Cliff, you are very focused on this tree. The Seattle Times said this tree died because of climate change. Charles, I think you posted about this in the Stranger's Morning News. Cliff, you posted about this on your blog and said, the problem with the Seattle Times story is that they are attributing an event, a real-time event, to climate change without proof. And this is exactly the type of thing that Charles is talking about, that Someone comes out and says, here is an example of climate change. People say, yes, this is an example of a very urgent pressing problem that we need to respond to. And you come in and say, no, this is getting ahead of the facts. And Charles says this sows doubt. Well, I think it's very important that society has facts. I think the, it's key for people like myself, climate scientists, weather scientists, to give people the straight truth. And when you see the headline of a major paper in, in, this, in this city giving 
information that is absolutely factually incorrect, someone has to say something about it. Their story was factually wrong. They were claiming that this was due to climate change and specifically that the situ- that our summers were getting drier and warmer. And in fact, as I showed in my blog, this is factually incorrect. The people of Seattle deserve to have accurate information from their news sources. You said on your blog that our summers are actually not getting warmer over time. That's well, what I said is we're getting slightly warmer, like a tenth of a degree, something like that. And they are, in fact, getting wetter, not getting drier. So the Seattle Times explicitly stated that we were getting drier during the summer. In fact, I even went to talk to uh, the person that was quoted, the the Mark Zuckerman, who was the the, the, the person who's head of horticulture at, at the uh, Washington Arboretum. Where the dead tree is. Right. And I had a long talk with him. And I, and, and I said, well, what's this business about climate? I said, do you have, you know, you talk to the reporter. Was the, uh, what did you tell the person? We said, well, did you have any facts? He says, no, I never checked anything about precipitation and temperature. It was my feeling that, that, that climate has changed. So did you go to the Seattle Times and demand a correction? I went on their comments and noted that it was incorrect. Okay. Charles, this is an example of what you've been talking about. Something happens in our world that people feel is connected to climate change. And Cliff comes in and says, hold on, you don't have all the facts. And you come in and say, hold on, Cliff, that's dangerous. What should he have said? Um, you know, the tree situation was really complicated. I sort of admit that trees and parks are not the same as trees and forests. And they're susceptible already because um, pines are very social, social, are very social um, living things, right? And... Um, and so there's all these other factors, right, that are that are at play in that situation. And I think that to say that it's uh, climate change, I would only say that because I believe that there is it is happening, right, that you can sort of make that guess that this is maybe a consequence of that. Now, here's my thing: I, I didn't check the stories, I didn't check the 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 the, 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 the background, and I sort of read Cliff's um, piece on the. Um, on the temperatures um, changing slightly and there's more precipitation and so forth and so on. Although we did have two brutally long and very hot summers, I did not know how that factored into the, uh, to the information that he gathered. But I was sort of interested in knowing um, which event then um, in Cliff's Moss world um, at all suggests climate change. I haven't, I've been through his website and I haven't seen one event yet weather situation, weather um, process that, that, su- that su- suggested to him that this may actually be a mark or an indication of, of, um, of, uh, of climate change. And so that, and that a, absence is curious to me. This is a fair question, and it's an absence that you actually noted in your post on your blog about the Seattle Times story, which you say is false. You brought up that a lot of people, and Charles right now is bringing this up, say, Cliff, why do you spend so much time poo-pooing reports of events that are indicative of climate change. So why do you do that? And Charles's question, is there anything out there that suggests to you that climate change is happening and having effects right now? Well, now it's time for Climate 101. You would never see me say one event means that we've, we've seen climate, climate change. And that's a very rigorous approach. One event does not tell you anything. But if you're looking about climate change, it's the trend that counts. And so one extreme event, because there's always extreme events. There were extreme events 50 years ago or 100 years ago. So one extreme event proves nothing. It is only the trend that makes a difference. The other thing you look for is to see situations that are indicative of climate change. And we have some ideas of what we expect because we have climate models that we run out for 100 years or more. I run these models. There are certain signatures of climate change, and a lot of these events do not show the signature. In fact, they're contradictory to the signatures of climate change. And I could be more explicit about that. So I'm very careful about this. One event doesn't do it, and there are ways we can get insights and whether event is associated with climate change. So you're poo-pooing the focus on individual events, whether it's this tree dying or you two have had debates over the fires in Alberta, Canada in a previous summer, whether that was 
an event that signified climate change. You're trying to be more rigorous on that. But the other question, is there anything out there that to you suggests climate change is real and happening? Yes, and I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, One would be the trend towards warming in the Arctic. That is a rigorous example of something we expect from climate change. If you look at the global climate models, the GCMs, the trend they show is warming in the Arctic. That is a signature of climate change, and we are seeing that happen. So that's an example of something that really shows that you know, this, climate, this climate change due to uh, anthropogenic global warming is actually happening. So like I said at the beginning, you both believe in global warming, that it is happening, climate change, if we want to call it climate change instead of global warming. And I have started to feel that actually the core of your debate is really just how you speak about it. Am I getting that right, Charles? I think that the big difference between us is that I take um, power effects in society as real. And I think that um, we talk about certain things in certain ways um, for specific reasons, right? And so my question is, do the comments that, that, um, that Cliff makes sometimes, uh, who, who benefits from those comments? And I, I just asked that question. I'm not, I'm not saying whether or not, uh, this is not, this is beyond the science. I just want to know if those comments, which you take, if you take the middle road, so he says, he sees himself as being moderate and not going towards sort of like the, 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 the lefties who are, you know, ringing the alarm too much and not, you know, jumping to conclusions and, uh, and then the right who just completely deny it. He says he's not taking those positions. He's in the middle and, you know, being a gentleman, democratic type, you know, reading, looking at all ends and then making a, uh, an informed conclusion. Well, so you're and you're asking who benefits from the from that from that from that position. <laughs> okay, but a lot of times when people ask a question like that, they've got an answer in mind. So let's just put all the cards on the table. Who do you think benefits from fomenting or just raising uncertainty about climate change? Uh, well, the question you have to ask then is the next one. I'm sorry, it's a little touch philosophical. It's not. I don't want to get too. I'm not going to get philosophical. But it's the next thing you ask then is if you're the person if the person on the left is ringing the alarm and jumping like they say the tree was damaged by climate change let's say that's that was a bit much let's say they jumped to the conclusion i would ask well what do they benefit from saying that what do they get essentially the the person who's ringing the alarm yes. maybe loudly or loud beyond yes, the yes. scientific what are they what are they what 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 is in it for them right i mean i answer that question like i mean do they get i can explain that you know, do they get more? Right, no, 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 no. But then I, then I have to go to the other side and say, who has to, by denying or going quiet or even being in the middle road, I mean, who, in a sense, I mean, how do you benefit from that position, right? And, and, I, and I say this in the background of what Cliff Moss knows very well is that there's a consensus on climate change, right? And mm-hmm. he has to explain. He knows this. Mm-hmm. There is a consensus, a scientific consensus from numerous scientists in different fields all agree that it's actually happening. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, I'm not saying that. So I want to know who, you know, addressing climate change means upending a lot of the, the way the, the system, the economy works. And I want to mm-hmm. know who gains, who loses. And when you ring the alarm, right? If you're a Democrat, I mean, what do you gain from doing that? That's okay, all. so I gave, I was giving yeah. you a chance that's, to that's answer not, your yeah. question, but but you yeah. didn't exactly. But Cliff has the answer. Yeah. So who do you, he says yeah. who benefits on the left when the alarm is rung very loudly? Sure, I'll let me, let me explain that. You know, I think Charles completely misunderstands the power structure in this country and about what is happening in terms of the politics of this. And let me explain that. Why are, why are people exaggerating these events? It, I think it's pretty clear. Um, There are people who are concerned about climate change. And the fact of the matter is our country, mankind, are not doing enough to stop it. It's it's going to happen the rate it's going, okay? We're doing very, very little about it. And so what these people feel, they feel and they also see that there really aren't many, especially around here, there aren't really very many things you can really point to. This is due to climate change. And so in sort of desperation, what they're doing is they're trying to hype up and exaggerate uh, events that are probably natural that are occurring in order to inspire people to do the right thing. What's wrong with that? Well, that's wrong in a number of ways. Number one, society has to have accurate information to adapt to climate change. Climate change is going to happen. 
There's no the, – the gases in the atmosphere already ensure that we're going to warm. We're going to have to build different infrastructure. We're going to have to modify our infrastructure. We have to get adapt, have adaptation resilience to what's going to happen. And so society has to have – accurate information about what pe- what we believe is going to happen. We cannot exaggerate it because we have to do things to prepare. The other thing is political. Dealing with climate change will only be successful if we do it in a bipartisan way. Take a look at this country. See how much is red and how much is blue. Well, I hate to say it, but most of it is red. And we are here on, on the coast. We're, we're, we're a minority, really, in terms of the area of this country. Even in population, we're not a majority. So in order to move forward, we have to move forward in a bipartisan way. And going off to extremes, ex- obviously exaggerating things, trying to bring in other types of issues into, this, into the mix of global warming, makes it impossible to do things in a bipartisan way, which will make it impossible – for us to really do the things that have to be done. People like Charles, people who are pushing this kind of sort of you know, left-leaning you know, uh, type of, of, uh, of approach are undermining our ability to do what has to be done. And a good example of that is the carbon tax. What we really need in this country is a national carbon tax to help pull us back from the use of carbon. That's something we could do, and that would that would allow private sector to move ahead and, and, and encourage them to work on renewables and things like that. But what we've seen here recently with 732, the left actually torpedoed 732. So I'm going to pause you yeah. here just for people who are not up on this. This is Initiative 732, which ran in Washington State last year. It was a big fight on the left. It was a big fight here at The Stranger also. Uh, it went down for lack of a unified left support for it. If the left had supported it, it could have passed. And we would have been the first state of the union to have a carbon tax. It would have been huge. But we lost that opportunity because the politicization of this issue and and, and rejecting the idea of having a bipartisan approach. So I, I do want to get you to answer a question that you raised, though. You said, I think Charles completely misunderstands the power structure in this country. What's his misunderstanding? The misunderstanding is it has to be bipartisan. And I I don't want to steal your thunder, Charles, but what is the evidence so far that bipartisan work to combat climate change is is anywhere uh, in evidence, I guess, or has had any effect? Well, we can see what's happening. The 732, for instance, was for the, the carbon initiative was a very bipartisan group. Recently, uh, a group of uh, well-known Republicans, you know, were pushing a... No, but I'm asking, and then I want to let Charles in here, but I'm asking, can you point to some bipartisan action that has done something to combat climate change anywhere? Well, one example is the bipartisan support of climate research. That is something that is very much evident. It was even evident during the last few weeks. Okay, but research has so far not led to action. Charles... Mass says that you completely misunderstand the power structure in this country and that alarmism is self-defeating because it inhibits bipartisan. Yeah, you know, first of all, um, we have very different political views or at least very different ways of looking at politics. I'm not convinced at all that the solution to the crisis, and I call it a crisis already, is going to, be, is going to come through the private sector. And it's, it's going to come through government and a strong government action. I mean, I don't, I don't buy for one second that the scale of the problem, first of all, can be solved by individual states that are not, uh, that are not connected and making a concerted effort against the situation. And I don't believe, again, the market will provide any um, solution that's meaningful, right? And so I, that I put out right there. So I I'm, did I'm, you were you in favor of initiative 732 last year? Do you know I I just felt it was cosmetic as far as I could tell. I know that uh you know the BC British Columbia has one as well. And or I suppose carbon tax. I sp- carbon tax yeah. And I suppose there've been sort of efforts um of that kind uh in the past and I think maybe it would have been symbolic uh, if it was implemented but um I I I want to have and I think it's necessary to insist on 
a reorganization of the economy that is orchestrated and conducted by the government without with a complete indifference to the needs of uh, of uh, of the private sector so and this and this and this and this this when i say this i mean here we are i mean he's talking about meeting um, you know a bipartisan situation and so on and so on i see that as just gumming up the process we would just end up being slow i mean um, half the people on the right believe that an ape invented the universe you know i mean i'm not and, and they don't you know I mean, they're not really going to take a lot of this kind of thing seriously right or understand how serious it is and and then the other half are completely tied to business interests that are entrenched and fear being upended by a radical transformation of how we consume in the society. And so, and the way to create, if I hear you right, the way to create this radical transformation is a strong central government action, something like a Manhattan Project. No, even, yeah, how we went into into World War II. To combat climate change. That's that's what we're talking about. People might not have heard this, but my ear picked it up a minute ago or a few minutes ago when I was asking Cliff, what's wrong with ringing the alarm maybe just a little too loudly in moments? And you were saying, that's right. And I I wonder, do you feel like if what we need is a mobilization on the scale of, uh, you know, getting into World War II or something even potentially bigger than that, do you feel like, okay, if we ring the alarm a little bit too loudly, but it gets people mobilized in a way that they're not right now, what's the harm? Yes, exactly. I, I believe that. Well, what do you do? You you have to change how you how you how you how you how you move around. You have to change how you what I mean how you buy. You have to change what you buy, and so forth and so on. Um, and then the question is, well, I mean, if we're wrong, and it doesn't get as bad as we thought, um, my conclusion is, well, it's better to be wrong in that direction than to be wrong in the direction that says. Uh, of the climate deniers, right? And that says that it's not happening and then they're wrong and then we've done nothing at all. So my question is, which kind of wrong do you want, right? Cliff? Well, I have a lot to say. You know, first, I, he's proving my point, really. He says that only government can deal with this. Well, I hate to tell you, the government's controlled by the Republicans right now, both houses of Congress and the presidency. So, you know, you, you've lost government. If you if if uh, Democrats and the government you you care about, so if you've got to get government involved, you know you have to, you have to deal with the people that are in power right now. Let me tell you that by having a middle road opens up doors. The fact is, the people who are screaming on on uh, about exaggerating stuff, they don't get to talk to people. Um, but talking in the middle, I've been able to talk to people like the Association of Washington Businesses or Puget Sound Energy or people like that. I was able to go to the Rotary Club in eastern Washington and I found – and these people are totally Republican. But I found that they were interested in, in, in global warming. They were concerned about global warming. It is possible to reach out to these people and create a middle ground to work on things like carbon taxes, etc. Now, you know, the only way out of this issue is technological. Um, people, we, we've tried your way now for the last several years. You know, the exaggeration and you, you had a democratic administration – What's happened? Very, very little. Carbon dioxide's going up radically right now. And most of it's not even due to what's happening in this country. It's due to what's happening in China and India. So let's talk reality here. What's driving global warming? It's outside of the country. You have people, you have situations where people want to live like we live. And so it takes energy to live like we live. And so they're putting in you know, hundreds and thousands of coal-burning plants. That's what's driving the CO2. That's what's driving the problem. So how do you go after this? We have to come up with the technological solutions that will allow them to live like we live, live, in, live, in, live a middle-class type of lifestyle, be able to get around, to be able to have fairly high quality of life. That's what we have to figure. It's a technological solution. Now, people on the left do a lot of talking, but they don't do a lot of acting. Uh, I find that some of the most knowledgeable people about climate change do the least. For instance, they fly around. Do you ever take airplane rides? Uh, do, you, do you ever fly any place? Do you ever go on a vacation, either one of you? Well, if you've, done, if you've done that, you've thrown it all away right there. One long trip to Europe is equivalent to commuting a whole year. And people on the left seem to be very happy, happy doing all these flights and going all around the world but they're throwing it all away every time they do that. So the solution here 
really has to do with technology. How do we get technology forward? If we have a national carbon tax, we put pressure on the price of carbon, and that will encourage the private sector. We have national research to deal with renewables and new energy sources. That's the way to solve this problem. There is no other way to solve this problem. Charles? Oh, my God. Um, Holy moly. Uh, um, um, There is the the technological fix. is to me a touch far-fetched, um, considering the scale of the problem. Um, and also considering that uh, right now the government is not even spending that much on research, or as much as they should be doing, right? So the Republicans, of course, are um, promoting austerity. Um, budget cuts are happening all over the place. Um, the, uh, the tax, the biggest issue for them is tax cuts for the rich, not an in, not a substantial, not a significant increase in the kind of research that's necessary, which means you have to understand that in the in the market, and this is sort of something that came out in a really great book by um, called the Entrepreneurial State, is that most of the uh, research that's done, say for example in pharmaceuticals and so on and so on, most of that comes from the government, right? And so a lot of the companies that sell dr- drugs and so on and so on are more like knowledge brokers. They're not actually making these drugs, right? And a big chunk of the drugs they also make are copycat drugs. So they're trying to figure out how to make a drug like another company. What's, was, what became clear is that um, companies are spending more time, even Boeing is doing this as well. They're not really spending time doing the deep research that's required, right? They're spending more time buying back their stock and so forth and so on, um, meaning that uh, they prop up their stock for their shareholders and they they have to buy – they buy the stock back w- with their own money. But bring this back to your no, no, skepticism no, 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 about I, a technological I, fix. For no, no, because, because you cannot have a technological fix if, one, you're not – you don't have a well-funded government. I mean, I mean you, you need – the government needs to be able – to do that research and pay for it and not be obstructed by people who are clearly, right, working in the interest of those who would lose if there is any massive change in the way society is currently configured. And I'm just saying that right now, you know, we don't, we don't, we, we're not, we're not making those investments and they cannot come from, what I'm trying to say is that private industry, right, is, 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 comes in usually at the end of the day. The kind of research he's talking about is, is, is no guarantee of profit. Without, uh, without, without as, government yes, support. Without, and then how yeah, – without so a return. To right. his point a moment ago – Can I say he, something? This is just completely wrong. Well, <laughs> hold on. I want to I address yeah. a question that you raised a second ago. So Cliff said in, in his last uh, moment when he had the mic, you know, look around you, Charles. The government is controlled by Republicans. And it sounds like what you're saying here is, yeah. And the way that you, Charles, see – changing that reality is by sounding the alarm really loudly, loudly enough that people vote them out and you get an administration that is going to invest in the kind of research that's needed to produce potentially technological change that would combat global warming? Is well, that what you're saying? Well, sadly enough, the Democratic Party is not even enough as at this point. So what is required politically? <laughs> sadly, it's going to take a disaster as far as I can tell because we have to wait until something really bad happens that we'll address it because at the present moment, he's right. Um, Cliff is right about the, 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 the flying on airplanes. He's right about all these things because we need to put that into our perspective. We need to actually question those kinds of activities. And that that goes back to exactly my point can about I, the way we something? consume. It's gone for more than two minutes. So my, I'll wrap it up. I mean, really quickly, it's just that I, I, I think that the government is, is being attacked right now because they know that it is the only real solution to the problem at hand. Only the government can do the uh, kind of um, work or the kind of investment, can make the kind of investments that do not require returns very quickly and are not pressured, right, by, uh, by say, you know, pe- you know, by stockholders and so forth and so on to, to, uh, to perform. So science, the real science that – this real science that I think that, that we need right now is outside – is going to happen outside of the market. Okay. Cliff. Well, Charles, facts matter. And much of what you just said is factually incorrect. Let's take research budgets. 
In fact, the climate research budgets were supported during the, re- the recent administration. It's, it's, it's rose through the Obama years. It rose even more during the Bush years. So we have a healthy research enterprise now in climate research. In fact, you know, one thing you said in one of your headlines, you, you criticized me for, for saying that the Republicans were going to protect science. Well, they did protect science. You were factually wrong about that. So the research for technology – for climate research, it's all still there. It has not been knocked down by the Republicans. I don't know about you, but I talked to Republican staffers in this House Science Committee. And one thing they told me, no matter what Trump does, they're going to protect science. They're going to protect climate research. So that's just wrong. Now, in terms of the technological side, you're wrong about that too. There's been a tremendous investment in wind energy and solar, and that has taken off. There has been a profound change during the last 10 years. The cost of solar, uh, solar power has gone down by the order of 10 or 100. Well, wind energy now has become you know, economical. It's cheaper than oil now or, or fossil fuels. And so we see now an exponential rise in the use of renewable energy. It's taking off now. I know people in the industry. Some of my students are in the industry. So we have made huge progress based on scientific research, technical technical research that the government has supported. This is not a failure mode. Just check on what's happening now. And so, it, and it, let me finish. And then there's the expectations for a lot more in the future. There's a whole new series of sol, solar cells that'll probably be five times cheaper. The whole world is changing now. This is not a failure situation. This is nothing. The Republicans haven't stopped, have, haven't gone against this kind of research. They've supported this kind of research. So what you're saying is just factually incorrect. Charles, hmm? do you have anything to say about the facts? I have another question. If you want to, okay. So what you're saying, Cliff, is never mind the way we talk about it. Never mind the political problem, which you're saying is not really a problem in any case, because technology is going to ride to the rescue and already is. It can rise to the rescue. We have much more to do. It's not like the technology situation is over. It's not. We need to get solar cells that are 10 times, that are 10 times more productive. We need to figure out how to move energy around the nation. We need to figure out how to store energy better. There's tremendous amount of research going on about these technologies today. What about I, – what I hear Charles pushing on a lot is human behavior change. He is trying to figure out – tell me if I've got you wrong, Charles. But he's trying to figure out how you get people off the planes, how you get people out of the cars, how you get us investing more in Seattle in transportation that gets people out of vehicles that are emitting a lot of CO2. You don't sound worried about behavior change. Well, because I think the behavior, say, the behavior change side – is a lost cause, quite frankly. The most knowledgeable people about global warming are people in my department. These are people who are the world's leaders in climate, okay? They know the problem better than any other people in the world, but they're not stopping themselves from taking that vacation in Europe. They're not stopping themselves from having that second house. They're not restraining their driving. So a moment ago, just to, just to flash back, you yeah. were criticizing me and Charles for, you know, potentially taking European vacations and so on. But actually, the most informed people are still doing that because and I want to let you keep going on this. I think what you're saying is behavior change on an individual scale is pointless. Basically, that's right. You know, you have to, it's only the technology that allows you to change your way of life. You know, there was a, there was a lecture by Jar- Jared Diamond. You know who he is, the, the guy who wrote Collapse, yeah. right? Yes. You know that guy? He, came, he gave a talk at, at, the, at the University of Washington. And then I, I put my hand up at the end of, the end of it and I, and I said, is, has there ever been an example in the history of mankind where people took, took economic – had economic pain to avoid a, an environmental problem or any kind of problem in the future? And he smiled at me and he said, no. And so I said, you're not very encouraging about people changing their behavior regarding global warming. And he said, no, I'm not. Okay. I want to bring Charles in here. Well, you know. What, what, talk about, 
your view on behavior change, human behavior change, its role in combating climate change, and how you get people to change their behavior? Because you are very focused on this. Yes, I am. But I want to – there's two things I want to say. Just one really quickly is that, I mean, we're bombarded by – car ads and um, they, may, they, they sort of advertise in a specific way to say that if you have a car, you're going to have this freedom and so on and so on. And so they sort of understand that they have to uh, build these kinds of habits, right? They don't just come naturally, right? And so what can be um, uh, done, meaning that we became um, a car culture through a massive amount of social engineering, which, which are called car ads, mm-hmm. you can reverse those. So these things are reversible. Otherwise, I don't understand. How do you get to a situation where you say that we need to live in houses with fences and so forth and so on? This was not the America a hundred or so years ago. This was an America that sprung up particularly right after the 1930s and and, and um, took off um, after the Second World War. So socially re-engineer you, you can, for a sustainable it, culture. It, that's right. I mean, they, they sort of understood. I mean, in the old days, I mean, if, you, if, if somebody uh, – uh, they had to like demonize – Walking, you know what I mean? Jaywalking was a way to like blame pedestrians for being pedestrians and so on and so on. I mean, but these laws came in and they certainly did encourage or give the idea that car ownership is, is, is a right or something that you should achieve, um, and is admirable and so forth and so on. Um, the amount of money we put into roads clearly shows that there's a preference for that form of transportation. And, uh, if you look at the, uh, interstate highway in the millions that went into it. Again, it was privileging that form of of, uh, of transportation. Those things were not there initially. So I don't understand why suddenly they're fixed. Right? One. My second one is, I know that Cliff Moss is, uh, is really into talking about population. And he believes that population is, uh, is something that we should take seriously. Um, and that uh, that we can, you know, that there's going to be real action. We also should, we should also should consider um, population growth and um and of course, uh, population growth is occurring mostly in, in the South, the global South. And I always feel that those who talk about population are sort of, again, avoiding the, and this is where we're, we're fundamentally different. Those who are dealing with like population are saying to them, are, are really saying that we don't want to change our habits. What happens is you can have 10 kids in Kenya and their carbon print is small. They mean tiny compared to having a baby in the USA, Right. And so the whole notion of like locating the problem with population is a bit silly because it's it's like, where is this population? Right. And so forth and so on. And so what I always like to emphasize is that um, the, the, the real, the real issue at here, and I think this is where, where Cliff is really incredibly wrong is that um, he doesn't want to accept the fact that there's going to have to be a serious transformation of this culture in the near future. Um, and that's all. So this is this is helping me actually reframe or restate your argument in my mind. Tell me if this is fair. You have a social engineering agenda. Yes. You want people to change their behavior. And what Cliff is doing by coming in and saying, hey, your facts that you're using to support your social engineering goals are wrong or not yet proven. It's kind of undermining that well, effort. Yeah, he wants technology to keep the system as it is, to keep things as they that's are. That's not correct. Okay, what's correct? Okay, well, we've tried social engineering, and that hasn't worked. You know, that that is that's clearly a road to failure. Now, I believe population is critical here. The real question is sustainability of our species on the planet. That's the real question. How billions of people can live on this planet indefinitely? That's the real question. Now, this global warming business—that's just a side issue. I mean, we're going to solve this one. We're going to have you know, renewable energy. We'll, we'll figure ways of not using carbon. And, and I suspect within, within the next few decades, we'll figure out how to take carbon out of the atmosphere. So let's now fast forward possibly 20, 30 years where we figure how to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And we're on renewable energy for most of our energy use. And the, all of a sudden, the global warming issue goes away. But we still have an environmental problem. That's sustainability with the planet. And we, it's not only... It's not only the temperature, it's water resources, all kinds of resources, and whether we're polluting the planet. The sustainability is the real issue here. Now, you said that people, those, those kids in Kenya, you know, they, they don't have a big carbon footprint, but they want to live like we do. And we can't tell them no, just like there were poor people in China that had a low carbon footprint, but now their carbon footprint is increasing because they want to live a middle class lifestyle too. 
the people in Kenya, they deserve to be able to live well as well. And then the time will come when they'll want to move up to live a first world lifestyle. And we cannot deny that to them. So in terms of equity, in terms of the future, it is clear that we have to worry about population. Now, there's an interesting issue here. To bring the population, to stabilize the population, we have to get everybody into the middle class. What we've seen around the world, like in Europe and even in Asia, when countries have become middle class, their population growth stopped. And so what we – it's happening in China. It's happening in Japan. It's happened in Europe. And eventually it's going to have to happen in Africa. But the only way we're going to start stabilize the population in Africa is to bring their, their lifestyle up to one they ha- that they have a middle-class lifestyle. Charles? You know, um, um, there, that's a very – you know, we in, in economics, there's a, there's a whole field called economic development. And that was sort of the model for, um, for development in the third world. Right, that that you had to uh, implement, um, you know, grow the industry in such a way, um, in, increase car ownership, home ownership, and things like this. And this is called modernization, right? And this is what Cliff is discussing. And there's a whole school dedicated to this sort of thinking, right? And you know, usually the companies in the USA would would encourage uh, a third world country to to build roads and do this sort of thing, we'd even give some aid in, along the road, then, as long as they bought their materials. This yeah. is this is. This is, a, you know, this is not new. Uh, the big question is, is that um, we're in a situation right now, again, where we're, where the, the American lifestyle is is not is what's really unsustainable. It, this is what cannot be cannot be um, 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 exported across the world. And so, when you look at China, and just go back, and you know, um, uh, in, in the 1980s, if you look at a picture of Beijing, it's just bicycles on the streets, right? Just bicycles. And so the the um, the the arrival of of of, of those of the of the freeway was considered to be a progress, moving from you know bicycles to cars, and that shows that the economy is industrializing, right? That mm-hmm. was a, that's the sort of language. Now, if you looked at Denmark, you saw that they kind of went the other way. They gave up on modernization, and instead, no, no, so, sorry, not Denmark. Um, oh, Copenhagen, yes, it's Denmark, and so they uh, they actually reversed. They thought what that the whole notion of modernizing was kind of um, dangerous because what it led to was, you know, cars filled with streets and traffic jams and so forth and so on. And so they reversed. And so now you have a, um, um, a I think, I think, uh, I think almost 40% of all commutes are done by bicycles now. So what, what you're Copenhagen. saying is uh, the opposite of what Cliff is saying in the sense that you don't want the rest of the world to try to mimic the culture and lifestyle that we have in the United States. We need to uh, you wouldn't say downgrade, but like kind of reverse what we yes. called quote unquote yes. modernization I, yes. and set a new kind of level for acceptable living rather I, than. I, I, yeah, instead of vertical, what I call vertical development, I want horizontal development. Yeah. Meaning that's, then that's, I'm sorry, I'm just saying that we don't have to imitate um, exactly the, you know, no one, we don't have to, each person gets a car. We don't have to have that system. In Zimbabwe, um, for example, they used to be called pirate, pirate taxis. And they were there because not everybody could afford a car, you know. So, so someone who, could, who owned a car would actually pick up people and get paid and drop them off. Now we, we have something similar to, like that in the sharing economy, right, where, you know what I mean, where we sort of like don't need to all do that. And so what I would go and say to Zimbabwe is like, don't – just stay where you are. Actually, <laughs> you know, you don't you don't need a, you don't you don't have to um, end up on the treadmill of uh, energy intensive industrial products. So Cliff, uh, want- Charles is saying the rest of the world shouldn't really even want to modernize to our level, can't. And what we need to do is dismantle. Is our- degrow. Yeah. Degrow. Yeah. I think he's completely misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm not saying we transport all the cars and the freeways all over the world. That is not what I'm saying. I'm a strong supporter of using bicycles and mass transportation, extremely strong supporter. What I, and I, I never said duplicate U.S. lifestyle, but I'm saying the middle class lifestyle. And what do I mean by that? I mean a situation where you have enough food. You have reasonable clothes. You, you have a, your children are well are well educated and have opportunities. That you have the ability to get around, and it doesn't have to be in your own car. It could be mass transportation. It could be it could be bus. It could be any other way. When I'm talking about a middle class lifestyle, I'm talking when that you're not fearful that your children or yourself will die. That you'll have medical care when you need it. 
That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about transport, uh, bringing I-5 and moving it all over Africa and stuff like that. I am not saying that. And by the way, one thing you've got to consider about cars. You're, you seem to be really into cars. But 20 years from now, the cars around here are not going to have much of a carbon footprint. We're going to transition to electric cars in the next 20 years. So the whole issue about cars and carbon footprint, that's going to go away in 20 years. So I, I think the world is changing very rapidly. What is – well, wait. I want to – because you do have a lot to say about cars. Yeah, do I'm you gonna, believe I'm that? Not, I mean, no, I, I don't think – besides, you have to make cars and they take a lot of energy to make a car. So even if it's an electric car, it's still going to be uh, – still going to have a large carbon print just to make it. So, so what – I I really want to know, sitting here listening to this, what do each of you recommend an individual do? What I hear you saying, Cliff, is like there's nothing for an individual to do. No, I'm not saying that. Wait for the scientists to solve the problem. Wait for the technology uh, gurus to solve the problem and then do what they tell you. And Charles, what I hear you saying is – for an individual, they need to wait and hear which way the alarm is being sounded and then follow the leader who's sounding the alarm and do what they're kind of inciting you to do. So you say I'm wrong. You might say I'm wrong too. Cliff, what, what's wrong with how I described your position and what should an individual be doing? Right. People ask me that all the time. I give talks all the time. People ask me, what can I do? And you can do a lot of things that I do and other people do. I bicycle to work every day. Okay, that's a low carbon footprint. Uh, I have a very economical car. I don't use it. Ve- I don't use it very much because I don't use it for commuting. You know, I, I take mass transit where, whenever I can. I try to minimize the number of flights I, I take. I mean, those are the kind of things I I do personally. Okay, but quite frankly, no matter what we do here personally, is kind of in the noise level as long as China is putting on a thousand car. Uh, carbon emitting coal plants that is the truth so the the if you want to solve the you know we can talk about doing stuff but until we solve the problem of china in india and maybe africa then we're not going to solve this problem co2 is going to continue to go up i mean there's a matter of technical practic- practicality here so how is what i just said wrong you're saying wait for technology to give china india and maybe countries in yeah. africa the ability to produce energy without carbon emissions. We need in this country to develop those technologies. We have the technological prowess to develop a lot of the key technologies. We should be doing that here. What is going to push us to develop the key technologies? Well, I personally believe a carbon tax, a substantial carbon tax, is what will push this country towards development. We're already developing a lot of technologies, but we need even more encouragement by the way, you know who's talk, who talks the same way I do about this is Bill Gates. Bill Gates actually was talking about putting a lot of money. He did put a lot of money into working on energy issues. He's right about that. It's a technological fix here. Can you name one Republican leader who supports a carbon tax? Yeah. How, well, Baker, who was, uh, you know, the, the guy who was James Baker, James Baker, right? He's, he's not in power anymore. He's not in power, but he's but he was in power. One he, currently elected Republican right. in this state or at the national level who is championing a carbon tax. On the national level? I can't name one, but it doesn't mean there aren't any. Charles, I described your position a second yeah. ago, so tell me how I'm wrong if I am, and you get a chance to respond to this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, We're talking oh. about what people should do. Right. And, and the way I described what you're saying is Basically, listen to the alarm that I, Charles Mudede, am ringing yes. and do what I tell you. That's what you should do. <laughs> <laughs> I, have no, I have no embarrassment about, about that at all. I have no shame. I, I say it directly that the situation is dire and it needs action really quickly. And, um, and it means uh, – I mean and we're not going to get support um, from the Republicans on this issue because they have uh, commitments uh, to the – to, to keep things the way they are. Cliff wants to keep things the way they are and um, no, and wants to um, resort to uh, technology to preserve the American way of life. Um, technology will be like the, uh, you know, the, will, will come and save us at the last minute. And uh, I just don't believe that we're anywhere near that kind of uh, <laughs> solution. Well, so and, say uh, I'm ready, Charles. I am ready. Like you said, you have no shame. You are telling us to 
listen to you, follow you, yes. do what you say we need to do. What do I need to do? Concretely, well, well, what, what, do you, we, what, what, what we have to do is, you know, Cliff's, uh, the way Cliff lives, riding a bicycle, not using his car that much, traveling cautiously, um, or at least, you know, uh, being selective when he flies, um, being, you know, I need to see that in a mass form. I can't just have Cliff doing it. I need to see everybody doing that. Right. And so when you say um, social engineering doesn't work, you know, when I was a young kid in the 1970s, um, there was an advertisement that came on the television, which had a Native American on a horse. And uh, he well, he looked at all this garbage that, you know, because everybody you know, in the capitalist society, waste is not accounted or we don't really factor it in as a part of the cost. So we have to, you know, we have to face trash and all this stuff. And uh, so this ad, if you remember, he turns around and there's traffic and he cries and it hit people, right? It really made an effect. It had an effect on me. From that point on, I could never toss garbage on the ground, right? I, was, um, I became very conscious of, of waste, very conscious of what it, or what's of that. There isn't a vacuum that this, this stuff actually ends up back in the world, right? And so to me, um, my job as a person who writes, and I think Cliff is, should be responsible about this as well, um, is to tell people that and to, you know, provide the kind of um, model for uh, how to live in a situation that is defined by the need to make a, um, personal behavioral changes. So you think what he's writing is irresponsible? Yes, I do. Cliff? Well, I don't feel that way. You know, I feel my responsibility as a scientist is to determine what is going to happen due to global warming, find the uncertainties, and, com- and communicate that to society. So society can make decisions like how we will adapt, how we will work on infrastructure, and what we, th- we, what we need to do in terms of mitigation. It does seem, though, and you kind of admitted this on your blog this week, that you end up spending a lot more time on the uncertainties than the certainties in your writing. Why well, is that? Well, I'm trying to provide some balance here. I mean, we, we have a situation where we have a highly irresponsible media that has now crossed over from providing facts to advocacy. I think Charles is one of the worst about doing this, and, and that article in the, in the Seattle Times is another example. Your profession should be giving society the true information about what we really know about what's happening and what will happen. That's your responsibility. And by trying to get into advocacy, you are not fulfilling your responsibility. So I think this is a real media failure. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to balance that off. I'm trying to say, listen, some of these facts are not correct. And, and so I'm trying to correct what you people are doing so irresponsibly right now. Charles, you're you've, you're embracing the idea of advocacy here. What are you trying to do? Oh, I mean, I've said it before. I I I think that I want people to change the, the way they live, quite quite profoundly. That's what I'm. That's what I'm about. I mean, I'm saying the same thing a little bit, but I and I think I'm hitting a wall because I can't figure out how to get around Cliff because um, this is without without this without this understanding that uh, that there's, there's a sense without a sense of urgency. Right. In talking about um, um, not just the, the way cities are, 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 um, are built or the way that they work, but also talking about where you live, you know, in the USA. I mean, you can no longer I mean, the, these kinds of uh, the, these kinds of things that were instituted right after, you know, right after World War Two and uh, living, you know, in the edges of the cities and things like that um, in, 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 a, in single, you know, in, in houses that are separated and so forth and so on. I mean, these things cannot go, cannot happen anymore. And I, and I, I don't know how to, this is, I'm the bearer of bad news. You know what I mean? And because I know it's really hard to change your ways. And, and also, you know, the society sort of promises us that we are, that we will get these things. So it, are you, it, is what's underneath some of your concern about Cliff a suspicion that what he's really trying to do with all this question raising is defend his unsustainable middle class life? Yes. Well, that's completely. That's completely. No, but I mean, it's not you. Uh, you know, that, that, you, that's, you, that's you, you, you live in a way that I would say is admirable, but the people, you know, a lot most Americans don't live that way, and it's important to show them, like, no, you should actually. But you won't the change them. See, that's that's the point. You're you've tried your approach. You have failed. 
I don't have okay, to Okay, now it's time working. for it. Now you have failed, and you have failed because you haven't reached out to the other side. Your approach is what gave us Trump. No. You're quite frank, quite frankly, you know, I heard you make it calling names of Republicans and saying they, they, they didn't believe in evolution and stuff like that. It's the deplorable thing. It's it, the attitude that you are promulgating created Trump because what you have, you haven't reached out to the middle. Now, I'm, you have failed about this global warming business. People like me are trying a different approach. We're trying reaching out to the middle to see we can get a bipartisan approach to deal with climate change. So why don't you give us a chance to try instead of calling us names and, and saying we're crazy and things like that when we're trying just a different approach than you are? Um, I don't know. that. To me, that just sounds a lot like a waste of time. And um, I'm – and it doesn't sound serious to me at all because um, there hasn't been any seriousness from the right about this issue. I don't know. Carbon suddenly, tax. There's a lot, on the, a lot of people in the Republicans who are ready to go for a carbon tax. You, though, a minute ago could not name one elected Republican Look at the who is ready to go. Look at the – I know the right now, middle of the road Republican leaders, including Baker. You know, he's not in power right now. But – and he was joined by some senators and stuff. But I, forgot, I forgot their names. So we have some middle of the road Republicans feeling that way. We had a lot of Republicans that supported the, the, the carbon tax. So the, the people, people voted that way. It wasn't in eastern Washington. There were plenty of people who voted for it. So don't tell me that's not there. I go and talk at the Rotary Club in, in eastern Washington in Yakima. There were plenty of people there willing to support a carbon but tax. But how, how do you talk to these people? I mean, how, I mean what are you saying? Are you, are you bearing bad news to them or are you telling them it's okay? I mean, no, really? I am, no, I am bearing bad news. See, that, that's the difference. See, I can talk to them and you can't. The reason I can talk to them is they look at me as someone who's giving them the honest story. Because I have taken on the Seattle Times when it's gone. So just, let, just, just let me finish. When, because I have done that, they will listen to me. So I was there at the Rotary Club in Yakima. There were 900 people in the room, okay? Virtually all of them were Republicans, okay? And I gave them the story about climate change. I told them how the snowpack was going to disappear there in the Cascades by by the end of the century and the implications for, for their water resources. They listened to me. They said, we know that this is a serious problem. And they even talked about, you know, solutions. They want more reservoirs to store water for, for their apples and other crops, okay? So I had a dialogue that I could do. You can can't. I could because they see me as fair and objective. That's the difference. People like me can help solve this problem. People like you calling, calling them names won't solve the problem. There's, um, you know, right now, of course, um, when we, we're in the situation at this moment where we can't even basically uh, tax the rich in this state because of the voters that he so loves and believes he can connect with and bring to the table to take real actual action on a real problem. I mean, it's this fine. This is extraneous. No, no. It's, it's fine to say that, you know, they've gathered to hear you talk and it's fine to say that they understood to, to, to sort of have them t- touched by, an, under, you know, by, an, you know, the, They're ready to the, the, the facts of uh, what's happening. But there is no action. There is none. I'm That's sorry. Not true. I'm just sorry. There is none. I, I'll give you an example. There's a, Senator Cantwell is working with these people to develop a, a resilience adaptation plan that will actually change the reservoir structure per, to store more water when global warming occurs. That is, an, that is going to happen. Senator Cantwell has gotten money to start this project. So that, that is not true. Cliff, I want to ask you something that I'm now confused about. So if you rewind our conversation back, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, you brought up Jared Diamond and his book Collapse, and the question that you raised when he came and spoke in Seattle. And you said you asked him, can you give me any example of a human civilization that understood well the problem it was facing and took action to face that problem that adversely affected their economic fortunes? And he said no. And you raised this point to say, no one, you don't believe in behavior change. You don't believe that even if you give people a clear picture of what's going on, They are going to change their behavior. That's why you're so focused on technological fixes. Right. So if you believe this, why do you care what journalists say? You under this argument, even if we put out journalism that in your mind was purely factual, it wouldn't matter because we would be giving people the real truth, the clear facts. But historically, as you just pointed out, people don't act based on real facts when it's going to adversely impact their way of life. But they will make no. changes 
when it won't adversely affect their way of life. And just listen to me. So that's where the technology comes in. If we can transfer to new new technologies, let's renewable energies. Let's say if if we can use solar and wind and 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 the power doesn't cost anymore, maybe even costs less. They might be willing to make investments in that if they're probably if they're if, if they're educated about the technologies and about the threat. They need to know how long it will take for the warming to occur, and what are the implications of it, how much time do they have, what are these technologies will cost. They will make reasoned decisions. What I'm saying is, you if you folks don't give people the facts, society will not be able to make reasoned decisions. No, okay. If we if we followed his path, we'd still be smoking in cafes today. Right, we still be smoking in airplanes. That's not right? true. No, 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 no. Because, because, no, because, because that was imposed by the government. That was imposed by the law. You see, the, the thing is that you know, it, it, it's as if we, 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 you, you, you think we live in a in a, in a in a social sphere where suddenly we can just gradually think about it, go home, have a beer, and you know, and and discuss with among ourselves this problem, right? If you did that, I'm serious, we'd still be smoking in buses, right? We'd still be smoking in public places, right? If we did if that was how we operated. No, you have to take a strong arm and you have to change society from the top to the bottom, right? This is how it works. Because right now, what do you do? You have car ads, right? That do not and I'm sorry to go back to car ads because it's so because Almost one you're in every three. Cars, no, no, because one in, one in every three. <laughs> I, because, you're more into because, cars because, than I am. Because, you know, because when I go to, because I know you that. You try bicycles. You know, because <laughs> they don't advertise. When you, when you see what they're doing, the way that the kind of ideas that they, that they, that they, that they plant in people, right? They, they, they make, they say, well, your life will improve. You'll feel happier. They may even put a sexy person in the car or something of that kind. But the truth is, you're going to get stuck in traffic. Imagine if there are car ads that showed people stuck in traffic. Say, well, this car is great, but, you know, here it is. This is a model, whatever, and it's stuck in traffic, right? People will, ha- will completely change how they think about that particular technology and its consequences, right? Now, there isn't a realistic, right, a realistic way to think about these problems. And even if you present them and talk to them nicely, as Cliff does, you're not going to get much done because essentially the components that keep the society where it is will not move until we remove these these particular um uh, institutions and so you and, either and, need a strong arm, strong man, or strong woman leader, or you need complete social collapse. Well, we to have to people. accept that it's a, like like we did with smoking that it actually is dangerous, right? We have to say there's a consensus that it's dangerous, and we have to act now because the con- you know because the costs, the health costs are too high, and so forth and so on. And in your mind, Cliff is like a scientist who, in that era of trying to educate the public about the dangers of smoking, came out and said, "Well, there's well, some uncertainty." Well, no, no, yeah. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, yeah. That. No, no, he's not saying. What he's saying is that he goes out and he tries to tell these people, like, you know, yeah, smoking is bad and so forth and so on. Let's have a discussion about it. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I, I like, no, I'm not. I no. like, I don't want that. You, you no, know, that, that's not how it works. Society does not work that way. It, it, it maybe, maybe, maybe to you, the, the, from your point of view, but I've never seen society change on its own, right? With out a real commitment by the government to address a significant uh, problem. I mean, I've just never, I'm just sorry. Just what never. you're saying is scary. You almost sound like you want a totalitarian fascist leader to take over and do the right thing. This is, this is terrifying. So we, so we, so we, so we, so this is, this so it took fascism for us not to smoke in public well, areas. No, 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 no that wasn't, was that? that's not fascism. There was good no, no, science, no, no, there, 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 there was sorry. good science done showing that that secondhand smoke causes cancer, and so the government took uh, uh, took action. So what's wrong that, with that? There's nothing wrong with that. I've, so so why, I, sir, why, why, I, we, sir, why don't we do that I, with climate sir, change? I, 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 why don't we do that with climate change? It's a, there's a consensus that it's real. Why doesn't the government step in? The, because the, the, the Republicans are in the hands what, of but people the Dem- who have an interest to keep things the way they the are. Democrat, I got you. When the Democrats controlled the government, they didn't do anything. When when you, when you Clinton was president, Gore was vice president, the Democrats were in control. Did they do anything for like uh, the uh, mileage on cars? They didn't do anything. When, 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 when Obama was in control, when he had both houses of Congress and the presidency, 
did what did he do? He didn't do very much. He signed the Paris Accord. He did raise I'm, the mileage standards for but, cars, right, which the Republicans right. are now talking about undoing. Well, the Par- well, first, the Paris Accords, you know, they're not going to go. They're not doing very much. You know, if you read them carefully, you find that's not going to have a big impact on what's going to happen here. And here I agree with you. Yeah. I absolutely agree. It, it's, 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 it's very, very weak stuff. So, you know, one thing I got to mention is we can't cry wolf. And your approach, we, you know, we go wrong with this exaggeration. And then, then 10 years later, you find out it didn't happen. I'll give you a good example. Uh, about 10 years ago, there are certain mayors in the city were saying, oh, my God, the snowpack has, is disappearing due to climate change. Oh, the, you know, this is it. You know, we're, we're never going to have the snowpack again. And it's due to climate change. And then a few years later, all of a sudden the snowpack, you know, we just had a bad year or two. And then the snowpack came back. So, so if you start claiming stuff like that and then, it's, and then it doesn't happen. People but, look at you and they no, say, how can we no, trust the no, climate no, scientists? How can, no, we, cr- no, 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 how can no. we trust you I, if actually, you're giving us I information actually, that I was wrong? I commend the mayors for doing that because the – But it the, was the, false. The, to, for, because if they were wrong, if they were right, what a catastrophe, right? If they're wrong, snow came back. So what was lost? What was lost? But if I mean, you you got to make your decisions. I mean, we all deal with probabilities. Well, you you know that as a scientist, we all are and making. And that's what we should we, give people yes. about climate. Yes, there, you, to, there, there, there's there's. Let's talk about probabilities. That's the right way to talk about climate change. And the and you can look at the various possibilities. Society should have that information. What do I do? One of one of my big projects is to provide those probabilities. That's great. We'll give society probabilities and society makes the decision what they do. But it's not my responsibility to hype it or exaggerate it. And it shouldn't be yours either. No. You should tell if the I, truth. If I see that there's a, the snowpack is melting and, there's, and in the next year it's not around, I will raise the alarm. Because, but one year because there, is, there is consensus that global change is real. And so I I'm am going to – that. Because I want to say the probability is there. And so I'm going to look at the probability and say which decision is going to – hurt me which is going to hurt me more and i would say ringing the alarm is actually not going to be costly in the end than not ringing well the alarm. that's up to society if, make if, that our government leaders and the population with the popular vote will have that information and they will make the decision what they think is the proper way to go forward what evidence do you have so far that the popular majority in this country or the winner of the electoral, you know, the people who give the winner of the electoral college vote have made wise decisions about climate change? Well, all I can tell you is you look at the budget for renewable energy development, maintained. Uh, the climate research, maintained and supported, okay? Science support is, is up. So all I can tell you is that these, these people – are very sensitive to these issues. These Republicans in Congress are protecting science, protecting this kind of uh, this kind of money, and it's not it's not declining. So they are supporting it. I but I, you know, did you do know that Shell oh, and other um, oil companies do take global warming seriously, right? And so they're also talking about developing technologies, like he says, that would you know capture carbon and stuff like that. We hear this. I mean, but to them, that's more like. PR, you know, and, you know, it's not a... uh, Billions of dollars are being spent. And we have a revolution in renewable energy going on right now. But but which company... You can't put that aside. Which solar company is is, is dominating the market right now? Who's dominating the market? Who who dominates the... who who, Which companies are are the top 10 um, revenue-generating companies? I I, I certainly don't have that information in front of me. You'll probably find four of them are energy related and a number well, of them are also make cars i mean you're going to oh, find this out i mean just oh, go and look uh, certainly wind and certainly that's not true wind. you won't you yes you won't find wind anywhere close right you'll probably find a shoe company is doing better than the wind than a wind uh, than what a do wind. you mean by that no i'm just saying that these companies these are small things i mean renewable I really, energy I, I, is going I, I, up exponentially this is a tremendous success story but what I hear Charles saying is without government intervention and heavy-handed government intervention to encourage and support these industries, it's not going to happen but fast But that's enough. been going on. Yeah. The, the research and yeah. development and subsidies. I mean I know people – you know, they, people buy electric cars. They get tremendous subsidies. I know the wind energy uh, area. There's tremendous subsidies. So government is not subsidizing the, 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 inst- the installation of these units. The government is, is subsidizing the research. This is happening right now. You act like nothing's going on. Well, we have – you know, right now if you look – again, I'm sorry to bring up cars, but SUVs and so forth and so on are actually back on the market and you know, hot items. I mean, And that's because – and why is that? 
that. That's but, because gas prices w- went down. And so how do you right. deal with that? Carbon tax. Now you see why I want no, the carbon. We've no. got to get the gas price back up. That's the problem. Yeah, you know, the... the, the I'm the, glad you agree if, on a carbon if you, tax. If you, he doesn't if you, agree on a carbon no, tax. I know he doesn't, no, and that's part of the problem. If you, if you bring back gas prices up again, you have a second problem, then you make something like um, it, shell profitable again. I mean, and, prices, so, and so, I mean, it's not – the question is I'm just saying that uh, we are not seeing a revolution – in electric car production, we're not. I'm sorry. Tesla is about to put out a, tr- a new I, model. They I, they have like a million people signed up for it, right? I, I mean, it's this is a tremendous revolution that's about to happen. In 20 years from now, people will not be driving very many gas cars anymore, especially in our region here. I have to say, at the root of your support for a carbon tax, and this is yeah. irrelevant to whether I support a carbon tax or not, but at the root of it is, again, this idea that people are not going to change their behavior unless yes. they're punished into changing it. So I just want to raise again this kind of inconsistency in your idea yeah. that give people the good information and they'll act in sensible ways versus, no, actually let the people do crazy things and live their yeah. comfortable middle class life yeah. and vote for people who aren't taking climate change seriously, we're going to have to attack this through technology. And if we can get it through Republican-controlled administrations, a national carbon yeah. tax. Which you see doesn't make sense because people have to vote for that carbon yeah, tax. Right. Right. The carbon so, tax is their, is their decision. Yeah. They have to vote for it. So that's, so that's an educated population understanding about climate change. They will make the decision or they want a carbon tax. Or just to give Charles' argument a, a fair hearing here – or a population that is really fucking scared about the weather changing and about all these things that Charles is pointing to that indicate that their way of life is about to be upended unless they all jump at once towards something that is maybe not in everyone's individual financial interest but in their collective interest in terms of averting but, calamity. But, there, but there's no calamity here. There, so there's, there, no there, crisis, there's no crisis, right? There's no, 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 no crisis. Let me no, no. somebody who, who, who's looked at the climate. There is – there's no, no, there's no crisis. There's right? no crisis. Yes. There's no cliff I, you're going to go over. I, I, want, I wanted to hear that from you because well, – That's um, the best science that's available. Well, yeah, because there, that's a big problem because there is no sense of a crisis in terms of global warming right now. Right? There's a crisis for, say, uh, for the banks um, when they've lost a lot of money and they can – Turn government upside down and get all the cash that they want, right? But we can't, we cannot give society the same kind of panic about global warming that you would say about a, a market crash, right? So there is no sense of crisis. So you want to panic them with with facts well, that are not, with well, with information well, that's not true. What happened in two thousand and eight? Wasn't that panic in with the with the market crash? Well, that's the market. Now we're, t- we're talking about the. We're talking about the climate now. Yeah, no, exactly. And I'm the climate you, is not going to. The I'm, climate is not going to crash. Uh, around, I mean, it's particularly around here. There's, there's no. I, I, I've, I don't, I've looked at the no, models. I run I'm the glad, models. I'm glad we got to this point because this has made it clear. I mean, I feel there is a crisis, and I do think it's a larger crisis than the one that it's we. A the, slow, the, the, it's a slow. It's a slow situation. It's a slow no, evolution no, no, of the no, climate. No, it's, it's not. not it's slow. not. It's not going off of cliff. You haven't looked at the climate models if, if you think that's what's going to happen. It's going to be slow. It's going to be gradual. It's not – there's no cliff you go over with this climate business. Uh, no. I, if I was um, – OK. I'm not, you're, you're not well informed. No, 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 no. You're the scientist and I'll accept that. I'll accept that. Now, here I'm going to use my instincts. What I've noticed is usually you know, something um, in the sense of like Stephen Jay Gould, right? Uh, when he would speak about uh, an accelerated situation. So you usually have a, a thing that sort of gradually, you know, happens, and then there's a spike, right? And so you would call that sort of a, a positive, right, loop, right, in terms of like... You're talking about a positive feedback? The positive feedback yeah. loop, yeah. Or this idea that, like, these trends, and I think even you admit this, will but, accelerate over time, and right. you get past a... But, you might not but, go yeah, over and, a cliff, and, but you get past right, a tipping right. so point. So there'll, ex- there'll be an acceleration... It, the change in temperature around here is an exponential. No, but so 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 right now we're in the very slow. No, part. But no, at no, a but, certain but, point, no, no, but, it will I mean, be, my, my, it'll speed up. I should not have gotten into that because I, I, I the thing is that I do not want to get into a situation where it is accelerating. Right, right. And this is where my and I and I get into this thing where I'm like, okay, I'm not a scientist, but I can tell you that a lot of scientists say this is a real thing and something has to be done about it, and we should treat it 
as with the same panic that you worry, you know, that we that we that we confer on a market crash, right? And then with the same kind of uh, uh, um, you know media uh, right. noise, you know what I mean? Uh, the well, you tried the... that, you failed. You no, try, you no. try, you tried the panic. No, the media, we haven't. The media. Oh my, no, look absolutely. Look we look at have Seattle not, Times. We haven't done the panic yet. Yes, we're you, we're you, nowhere near where we should be. But you, you have know, done really, the panic. I mean, I want you to really <laughs> fear to your bones, right? I want you to shiver, shake. You know, that's the kind of thing that you, when you're worried about your job and you don't know when you're going to get your, you know, whether you're going to get a paycheck and your bills are piling, that's the kind of panic I want you to have. So you want to so, so you want to panic because, people because that's the panic that made and, people, and, and, that's the panic that made people vote in 2008 okay. for Obama because they freaked out that the Republicans would not be able to help them out. And so when I'm talking about climate change and worry and action, I want you to be so freaked out that you do not, you cannot throw a vote away as well, if it's something that, about but, but no, we have what you're talking about is something completely we haven't. You, you, you have you've, we haven't this is done completely it. unpractical. It's, no, no, no. This is pie no, in the why sky. Why is that practical? Because that's what they do. I mean, no, what, did, no, you, did no, you watch? No. Did you watch what happened in two thousand and eight? Did you read the newspapers? Did you see everyone covered the story? Did you see what happened in the last election? You, you see what you, you tried the same thing with, with Trump, saying, "Oh my God, the world's going to end." Uh, okay, you, you know, the left tried to panic people that if he became president, this is terrible things going to happen. Okay, and, and and he was elected. This is you, you're, you're going the same the same approach as that got Trump. My approach is different. My no, my no, approach no, doesn't no, get no, Trump. No, 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 no. There you go. You're saying something. I'm I'm saying the, I'm again looking at the way the crisis was communicated in 2008. The way that but, they, Trump, but there was a crisis. The economy was free falling. The climate's not free falling. I, so wait, I have That's a question a, here. Yes. So at you admit this at the point when the climate is in free fall, or if you flip the graph it's another gonna, way, it's never going to it, be in free it's, fall. It's yeah. it, the, uh, accelerating. The change, the change, the change, the change is accelerating, accelerating right. beyond the point of repair. It's too late. This is the Al Gore inconvenient truth theory, right? There, but that that's and that was to, wrong. There is no point Al Gore was wrong. That, Al Gore was wrong on many things, but there is no point that you can't repair. I mean, I mean there's there's no magical point. No, some tipping point that you can't get, you can't come back. The scientific consensus, as I understand it, is that beyond a certain number of degree Celsius change in temperature at, uh, in the, on the planet, we've reached a tipping point at which it is going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to pull back from. And they're trying to keep the Earth no, th in a certain that, range. That's inaccurate. That, it's not about tipping points. It's about say, having an arbitrary number, and you're trying to keep the temperature change within two degrees centigrade or something like that. Right. There's not a tipping point. It's nothing special about that two degrees. So we could go to four, and you wouldn't be concerned. We no. Could well, four is worse. No, 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 it's worse. We want. We we don't want to go there. So how do you keep? This is, I think, Charles's question. Like, isn't it better to alarm people at two, even if two doesn't feel super alarming? Because if they don't get alarmed now, they're going to get to four, and four is going to be really bad. And if they get to four well, without being alarmed, they're going well, to get to six and eight. Well, we can tell them that, but, let, but you know, we, we, we. But let me tell you something to prevent us. Will happen. That's what to prevent to, to, to stop us from getting to these higher numbers. What we have to do now is so draconian that people will not do it. What we're talking about reducing right now, if you want to prevent that two degrees, we have to pre reduce our carbon emissions by 90% now, right now. Thank you, Cliff. Right? That's all. Well, that's what Charles wants. Well, right. I, I, I know that's what he wants, <laughs> but he ain't going to get it. <laughs> no. he, he can want it all no. money. He can get this totalitarian guy to take no, over. No, it's not a totalitarian. <laughs> well, actually, well, no, 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 no. He ain't going to get no, it. No, no. Are you telling me it's not totalitarian? I'm actually thinking that having a you, you, transmitting a, uh, a, 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 a stable climate to the next generation is as democratic as I can get. Right? I'm sorry. Well, no, I'm sorry. No, no. That, uh, you want to lie to people, get a totalitarian person in to force them to to do what's good for them. This is this, this. This sounds like Hitler or Mussolini. It's really scary. Okay, yeah. I have well, a um, final a question. Mussolini. <laughs> <laughs> You're a green Mussolini. Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> Call me that. I'm glad we got to this point because I have felt for a long time that your disagreement is fundamentally about behavior change, human behavior change, mass behavior change, and and that's what I hear you getting really, really angry about when you're talking. And I just want to close with this question. Which one of you is more cynical 
about the ability of a mass population to change its behavior in time to affect climate change. Cynical. Yeah. Or optimistic. Cynical. Because I, I, what I hear you saying is that embracing cynicism is, is the right path here. Well, I'm not cynical at all. I'm quite optimistic. I think I, I know about the technologies. I know we have some time to, to, to fix things. I think by, by having an increasing use of renewable energy, st- stabilizing, stabilizing the population as much as we can, and I suspect there's new technologies that are going to come along in the next few decades that are going to be very, very helpful, including sequestration, getting the carbon out of the atmosphere. There's also the potential for geoengineering, which I'm not, I'm not advocating right now, but we do have the technological means to cool the planet down if we wanted to use it. So I'm quite frankly optimistic. I think our species is pretty clever, and I suspect – that we'll be able to deal with this problem during the next several decades. Thanks to the cleverest among us in your mind, but not really mass social change. I, that's right. I don't think mass social change will change anything because and I, and I've, I, we've seen the proof of it. Well, you know, um, Rex Tillerson would agree with Cliff on the technology stuff. He believes that technology will also come to save the day and repair the damage that his company or his former company has caused you know, and so forth and so on. So we, as a public, will have to pay for their mess. Again, right? So that's number one. Number two is technology is supposed to be, you know, there for us and you know, when we're supposed to be smart apes and all this sort of thing. But look what's happening in Hanford, right? I mean, they've been talking about solving that problem for years upon years. And yet, look, what no, no progress has been made. I mean, this is we're talking about a, a massive area that's contaminated, and yet, where is this technology? Where is this wizardry? Oh, this where, of where, 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 where? No, no, no. I'm just saying. I mean, if I was, I like to use models. I like to use models. You know, you know, Cliff, Cliff, Cliff says like he has models and computers. I like to see what has happened in the past, and to say how will that, what, what prediction can I make from from this particular environmental catastrophe right. and the way that has been handled. Right. And what I hear you saying is philosophically, you are extremely cynical about the ability for us to combat climate change without serious strong arm government leadership. absolutely absolutely you know the way that you put uh, in, in if you go to canada they have those uh, ugly throats uh, on the cigarette packets and they show you how hideous it is that's the kind of stuff I'm, that's the kind of that's the kind of muscular approach that i'm i'm, I'm advocating and i'll say one last you know i mean just to, just to say because i know that uh, you know i i i i understand that um People here in the USA are really fear that uh, that that a lot of the things that they mean sort of they've they've sort of been taught or been raised. Green Mussolini is not like a warm and fuzzy. No, it's not. No, it's not going to be nice, right? It's because because the situation is so serious, and we have to be honest to people. It's 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 not a it's not a it's not going to be uh, it's going to be exactly you know like the thing is that we we live in a society that's willing to make changes for say the military or make changes for say um, industrial corporations that are already dominating our economy, but we don't really make changes um, that, that I think are democratic in nature. That's all. We need to stop. If either of you feels after an hour and a half of this that I have <laughs> silenced you or not let you get your point out, I would remind you both that you have access to blogs. That's how this whole thing started in the first place. Cliff, thanks for coming on. Sure, my pleasure. Charles, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> 